So the SO2 and the oxygen have to actually come into this chamber too, where they get cleaned and they get dried. So this is actually a cleaner, and this is actually a dryer. So a cleaning and drying what chamber? See. So why should they be able to actually undergo all these two processes, cleaning and drying? SO2 and oxygen or air must be having impurities like carbon dioxide, dust particles, rare gases, nitrogen, and other components, even sulfur dioxide, and have also these impurities. So when the SO2 and the air are allowed to do this chamber, they have to get that point of being cleaned, where all the impurities accompanying them are removed. Because these impurities have an effect on the catalyst that we are going to use in this other chamber. So they first have to get removed. Impurities poison the catalyst that will offer a surface onto which these two are going to react to give us the end product. So they undergo cleaning, remove dust particles and other impurities so that the catalyst doesn't get poisoned. When that is done, they get dried. We want to get rid of any moisture because air is coming from the atmosphere. This air has water vapor as a component. So any moisture accompanying this two must as well be removed. So the dryer ensures that all the water vapor or the moisture accompanying our raw materials are removed. Now what can we use to actually remove the moisture? We can use, for example, concentrated. sulfuric acid sulfuric acid is actually used as a dehydrating agent it is used as a dehydrating agent to remove any impending danger in as far as moisture is concerned so that means it has to ensure that all the water vapor or the moisture is actually able to get removed from the raw materials or the reactors so concentrated sulfuric acid acts as a dehydrating agent you see so it is actually able to absorb moisture. You see, so it is actually hygroscopic. I mean, it has the ability to absorb moisture, but it cannot be able to form a solution. So it absorbs moisture, but does not form a solution. So it is actually hygroscopic. Of course, you understand that the SO3 is the liquid. It can absorb moisture and form a solution. So get the difference between the liquids and hygroscopy. Hygroscopy means the ability of a substance to absorb moisture but does not end up forming a solution. But the liquid sense means the ability of a substance to absorb moisture and form a solution as well. Good. So we have to dry the two gases by passing them through concentrated sulfuric acid or sulfuric 6 acid. Then the moisture has to get removed. So these gases are actually SO2 and oxygen. They are free from dust particles or impurities and other impurities, of course, and as well free from moisture because of the concentrated sulfuric acid or sulfuric six acid. When they get into this chamber, they are able to get preheated. And remember, I've told you, when the impurities get removed, we have to actually avoid the poisoning of the catalyst. See? So that means... The impurities are removed from these two reactors so that the catalyst does not get impaired inefficient because impurities impair the efficiency of the catalyst. So they will actually be able to poison the catalyst. And you can say some of these impurities are like a dust particles as I've actually mentioned. To actually explain this in a better way, how do these impurities get removed? There's something called electrostatic precipitation. So a process that can be able to remove these impurities like dust particles is electrostatic precipitation. Sometimes you can have two rods. Let me just explain something here. Two rods of this type. They actually allow a current to pass through them. So they have to actually develop a positive or negative charge. When the gases are passed here, like the SO2 and the oxygen. Any dust particles on them will find these rods having been charged. So the dust particles stick onto these rods which are charged. At the end of the day, the gases pass without the dust particles. The impurities are removed. 
the efficiency of the catalyst is well taken care of. The catalyst does not get poisoned. Good. To move forward, so electrostatic precipitation aids in the removal of impurities from this case. And again now, I can be able to actually move to this other chamber 3. So this is a cleaner and dryer. In chamber 3, the two gases, look at this, the two gases, SO2 and oxygen, are preheated. They are preheated in the heat exchanger. So this chamber is called heat exchanger. They are preheated so that they can be able to attain a temperature that can facilitate their reaction occurring at a faster rate. So they get preheated in the heat exchanger to attain a suitable reaction temperature before being passed into the catalytic chamber. You see? So the temperature ensures that the particles absorb heat energy, the kinetic energy of the particles of the reactants increase, the motion of the particles increase, they collide more, they end up having more successful collisions, and the reaction gets sped up. Okay, so in that case, this ensures the temperature is attained to facilitate the reaction. The forward reaction gets favored by having the temperature getting raised. Now, if I have to move forward, I can be able to introduce this as well. I'll be able to come here and say, now the SO2 and the oxygen have attained a temperature to facilitate their reaction. So, if I come here, I'll have the two gases getting introduced into the catalytic chamber. So, they are actually called catalytic chamber. In the catalytic chamber, we will always be able to actually suggest a catalyst that can work well. There are two possible catalysts that can work well here. We have what we call vanadium. I mean, vanadium. 5 oxide vanadium 5 so this is the chemical formula of vanadium when we are saying vanadium 5 so you have to combine oxygen and vanadium because you are saying vanadium 5 oxide so vanadium 5 oxide so that is to say if vanadium is 5 then you can put here 5 and because this is the valence of oxygen is 2 so the 2 comes here and the chemical formula of vanadium 5 oxide gets used as a catalyst. If you do not have vanadium 5 oxide, you can as well use platinum. It is called platinum rhodium catalyst. And now, most industries prefer using vanadium 5 oxide because of two very important reasons. Number one, vanadium oxide or vanadium 5 oxide is cheaper. And of course, you want to actually have this process becoming very economical. You see, so you don't want to actually spend more money. In producing something, the process becomes uneconomical. The expenses will end up being more than what the returns have to talk about in relation to the production of this acid. So, what we are saying is that vanadium 5 oxide gets used because it is cheaper. Number two, it does not easily get poisoned by impurities. So, two very important advantages of vanadium 5 oxide over platinum. One, it is cheaper. It becomes very economical for this process. Number two, it is actually not easily poisoned by impurities. This one is very expensive and it easily gets poisoned by impurities. Now in that case, that means I'm going to actually write sulfur dioxide and oxygen. When you see these things, that means the reaction is reversible. It can either shift forward or actually shift backwards. So the equilibrium either shifts forward or the equilibrium shifts forward. Very good. So the reaction is reversible. So that gives us SO3. Now look at this. Let me just come back here before I can be able to finish that. In the catalytic chamber is where we have the catalyst, the vanadium 5 oxide, or rather the platinum, depending on what you have used. But this one preferably gets used. So when the vanadium 5 oxide is here, the work of the catalyst is to offer a surface onto which the reaction can occur. It offers a surface. Look at this. This is the vanadium 5 oxide. It offers a surface onto which the reaction
reactants, sulfur dioxide and oxygen at the levels. So it offers a surface onto which sulfur dioxide and oxygen will do what? Will react. So the catalyst offers a surface onto which the particles of the reactants will react for us to form the product. Now, when this part has offered a surface onto which these reactants, SO2 and O2, so we have here SO2 and O2, at the right temperature because of the preheating process in this heat exchanger. So the SO2 and O2 are at the right temperature. The reaction to actually get shifted forward. They enter into the catalytic chamber. They find a catalyst. The catalyst offers a surface onto which they are going to react. And now, after you have formed the SO3, you always form SO3 and what? Heat. Now, the heat is a result of what we have had in the heat exchanger. So when the reaction comes back here, we have to take back the products through the heat exchanger because the excess heat that accompanies the product can decompose this product because this reaction is exothermic. That is to mean, when the reaction is occurring, heat gets given to the surrounding. So any excess heat within the system where this product is can decompose this product again to SO2 and O2 because I've told you the reaction is reversible. It can shift forward or it can shift backwards. So very high temperatures will shift the equilibrium to the left. Why? Because the reaction is exothermic. That means heat gets given to the surrounding. So just in case the heat gets increased, what happens? The heat can end up again decomposing the product formed. So an equilibrium shifts backwards. So take note of that. It's very, very important. Now if I come back here, so the product, which is actually now the SO3 plus heat, have to be taken back into the heat exchanger. And this indicates that the excess heat gets absorbed for your information. So the heat gets absorbed to lower the temperatures because the excess heat or higher temperatures can decompose again the product so the equilibrium can again shift backwards that's the role of actually having this product the SO3 and the heat again getting the, again back to where to the heat exchange to absorb the excess heat to avoid decomposing the product again formed to SO2 and oxygen gas number two when these come back here realize that or not that not all the SO2 and O2 would have reacted. Yeah, for that matter. That means they have to get taken back into this chamber so that the SO2 and O2 can again get heated to form more SO3. So the unreacted SO2 and O2 can further be able to get heated in this heat exchanger on getting taken back here so that more SO3 can get formed. Our aim is to actually have a higher yield of SO3 to increase the production of the end product. So the SO3 gets formed. So the basis of actually taking this into this other chamber as well is to ensure that one, the excess heat gets absorbed to avoid decomposing the SO3. Number two, to ensure that the incoming gases, SO2 and O2, which have not reacted, are able to get heated again to form more SO3. Okay, so generally, this is what you're supposed to know. So I can come back here and write V2O5. That is the catalyst that you have to use in speeding up the reaction. When that catalyst offers a surface onto which the reaction can take place. Now, you should note this. Very high pressures and low temperatures will actually compromise the process. Very high temperatures or very high pressures and very low temperatures can compromise the reaction. So, low temperatures and high pressure are actually necessary. Why do you say low temperatures are necessary? Because the reaction is exothermic. You see, the reaction is exothermic. So, low temperatures are favorable. You see, high pressures are favorable to shift the equilibrium forward. Can you the point? Now, in that case, that means that now, you are supposed to ask yourself a very simple question. This is one molecule, this is one molecule, there are two molecules. How many molecules do we have here? One. So that means, two molecules again, one molecule. And increase in pressure favors a forward reaction. So that it can equal the number of molecules on either side of the reaction. Because you have one, you have one. Those are two. 
when you have only one here. So a forward reaction gets favor when the pressure increases to equalize the number of mole molecules. Because one, one, then one. So one, one, two on the reactant side, one on the product side. To equalize the number of molecules, what do we do? Pressure has to be increased to favor a forward reaction. Good. Now, and for me to understand this in a better way, I should note this, that high pressures are favorable, low temperatures are favorable, but high temperatures are not favorable because the reaction is exothermic. High pressures are expensive to maintain, although they are actually very favorable. So, in other words, a compromised temperature of 450 degrees Celsius gets used. And a low pressure of 2 to 3 atmospheres gets used. You see, pressure can be measured in atmospheres, in millimeters of mercury, and then in pascals or in newtons per meter square. Because we always say, one newton per meter square is equal to one pascal or one capital P small a. Then people know that one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. 760 millimeters of mercury. The chemical formula of mercury is capital H small g millimeters of mercury. 760. Good. So at the end of the day, you should also note that one atmosphere as well is equivalent to 1.01325 times 10 raised to 5 pascals. So any can work. Newtons per meter squared, pascal, atmospheres, and millimeters of mercury or centimeters of mercury, they are all actually agreed in as far as measuring pressure is concerned. Just remember conversion. So there can be a way to maneuver around and know what you're supposed to write. Good. So having done that, you can be able to understand that low temperature, which are favorable, can get used. Low pressures, which are actually cheap to maintain, can also be able to get used. So in other words, the conditions which can be able to get called optimum conditions are a catalyst, preferably vanadium-5 oxide, which is cheaper and less poisoned by impurities. Number two, a compromised temperature of 450 degrees Celsius can also get used. Then a pressure of 2 to 3 atmospheres can also get used because low pressures are cheap to maintain. High pressures are actually expensive to maintain. You want to make the process very economical. When you are done with that part, I can be able to reduce something else which is different from this. So we have ended up forming SO3. This point, SO3. So if you have SO3, which is now a gas, my friend, SO3 cannot get dissolved in water directly to form sulfuric acid because our end product is sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So you cannot dissolve just this SO3 into water to form H2SO4. It's very dangerous. Why? Because SO3 in water can get referred to as a very exothermic reaction. The exothermic reaction produces a lot of heat to the surrounding. The heat that gets produced can be able to convert the mist fumes of this gas. Or can be able to actually turn this acid okay into a mist of fine droplets of sulfuric six acid the SO3 as the gas can just get dissolved in water to form sulfuric acid but now the problem is this acid has now a lot of heat the excess heat because of the reaction being exothermic can be able to actually produce a mist of fine droplets of sulfuric six acid. We don't want a mist of fine droplets of the acid. We want the pure acid in liquid form, not a mist of fine droplets of the acid because of the excess heat. That means the excess heat can actually turn this acid into gaseous state. And if it gets turned into gaseous state, we can get now the appropriate end product we need to actually have in our 
production process. So to avoid producing a mist of fine droplets of sulfuric 6 acid, what do we do? We first take the SO3. So we can just be able to put 2 here to balance the equation. In that case, we can put here 2. We can put here 2. So 2 sulfur. 2 sulfur. Then 6 oxygen plus 2. That is 8. 2 times 4. That is 8. Then we have uh, 2 times 2, 4. 2 times 2, 4. So that is balanced. So you can just produce sulfuric 6 acid. This is called sulfuric 6 acid. Just sulfuric acid by dissolving the sulfuric 6 oxide. This is called sulfuric oxide. You can just say sulfur 6 oxide. So, sulfur 6 oxide. Sulfur 6 oxide. Or sulfur as well trioxide why do we say trioxide tri that means three oxygen atoms sulfur trioxide so sulfur six oxide or sulfur trioxide get the difference with this this is referred to as sulfur dioxide di two sulfur trioxide trioxide three sulfur four oxide chemistry if they talk about four they should be half that is two so half of four is two then if they say sulfur six oxide six half of six is what three so get the difference between those two so you can just take sulfur trioxide or sulfur six oxide then dissolve it in water you get sulfuric six acid or sulfuric acid but the problem is that the reaction is exothermic the excess heat that gets produced and produce a mist of fine droplets of sulfuric 6 acid, which is not actually required. So what do we do? We can pick now the SO3, the sulfur trioxide or sulfur 6 oxide, and then dissolve it in first liquid sulfuric 6 acid. Look at that. So the sulfur trioxide or sulfur 6 oxide has to be taken in the absorption chamber or tower. In the absorption chamber or tower, liquid M, which is now sulfuric acid, H2SO4 gets mixed with that gas, which is actually so acidic, which is a choking and irritating smell. So, this gives us a product referred to as oleum, which is H2S2O7. It can get referred to as an addition reaction. Only one product gets formed, and this is actually referred to as oleum. Oleum. Good. So, in the absorption tower, we have what we call sulfuric acid gets mixed with what we call sulfur trioxide or sulfur 6 oxide to form what we call olea. So the living liquid is actually referred to as olea, which is liquid K. Olea. Good. So the oleum leaves. When the oleum leaves, now H2S2O7 is our oleum, it gets dissolved in now the water. So liquid F is water. This is where now water comes in. This is where now water comes in. So the water has to actually be taken in, it meets the oleum. Yeah, so we get the final product. So H2S2O7 called oleum has to get dissolved. So we can say first this is the gas, this is the liquid, and then this is the liquid. It's balanced. It's actually an addition reaction. Only one product gets formed. So the H2SO2O7, now the liquid, gets dissolved now in water. Okay, then we shall form now H2SO4. This is now the liquid as well. This is now the acid. So, the water, liquid F, gets taken into this chamber. This chamber is referred to as a dilution chamber. A dilution chamber. So, the dilution chamber takes in oleum from this end, then takes in on water from this other end. So, the water from this other end oleum from this other end have to get mixed here in this dilution chamber and we form sulfuric 6 acid or sulfurous plus oxygen to give what we call now sulfuric acid okay so that is actually to say that the h2s2o7 the liquid gets dissolved in water now the liquid to give you 
36 as it value of 2 which is now the end product of balance this equation gets value of 2 on this side 36 as it the equation gets balanced okay that is the aspect you're supposed to remember so we have now water we have the oleum they end up forming the sulfuric 6 acid which is now our end product our end product now considering that you have other aspects to actually put into consideration the national and environmental management authority has actually to have some dictating laws in as far as any production process is concerned so that is to say that for example if you look at kenya it has its laws in as far as what governs a produce, producing process or what exploitation industry is concerned. So that means any poisonous gas, for example, sulfur dioxide is a poisonous gas. It's a very poisonous gas. This gas cannot get allowed into the atmosphere. It actually causes what you call acid rain. It has an impact to the environment. For example, Corroding metallic structures, destroying uh, buildings, caused us to get the limestone that was used to manufacture cement, and uh, as well, it actually causes the leaching of the nutrients in the soil. It actually causes chlorosis. See, and in that manner, you have to actually ensure that ozone gets taken out. So the sulfur dioxide, which is actually a very poisonous gas that does not want to get allowed in the atmosphere, can get scrapped. So that means the sulfur dioxide. And get passed into chimneys lined with calcium hydroxide. And remember, calcium hydroxide is also referred to as select line. Select line. So the sulfur dioxide gets passed into chimneys. The chimneys are lined with calcium hydroxide. This calcium hydroxide scraps the gas. gas gets scrapped okay so what do we get of course this is an acidic gas this is a base it's actually aqueous so what do you expect expect to form a salt and water calcium sulfide as water great is the equation balanced one sulfur so it is actually a solid then you have what you call a liquid so sulfur sulfur two oxygen two those are four three plus one that is four then uh, one calcium one calcium then uh, two hydrogen two hydrogen and it's actually balanced it's actually balanced so that means the gas gets scrapped it doesn't get allowed into the atmosphere to avoid actually it poisoning the environment good so that is what I can be able to actually have in as far as today's discussion is concerned. And just in case you may want to actually emphasize more of what you call the manufacturing of sulfuric acid, please feel free to actually get more information from my next videos. Thank you so much.